<clears throat> Hello and you're very welcome along to another edition of the JMAC Podcast. I'm John Bannon and of course the podcast brought to you by orgaretch.com. These are the JMAC Podcast to get 15% off on the website coming into the semi-finals of the All-Ireland Football Championship and the Total Cup Final on the way. So get yourself organised on orgaretch.com. And tonight I'm joined by GA Sports Tracker app owner Kevin Kennedy, a Gaelic fan TV host and creator Aaron Prendergast and former Galway footballer Finian Hanley to talk about all of last weekend's All-Ireland quarterfinal action and of course a wee look ahead maybe to the All-Ireland semi-finals and maybe Total Cup Final. So really looking forward to chatting to the lads tonight. There's only one man to start with tonight. That's Finian Hanley. Welcome back to the podcast. What a win at the weekend, Finian. Johnny, it feels like a it feels like a lifetime since I've seen you. <laughs> it must be a year since I was on. It's great to be back. Uh, I'm live from Spain here, uh, southeast Spain, where it's thirty degrees and balmy. So I'm I'm, okay. I'm 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 happy on all fronts, John. After the weekend, I I've never celebrated a match as much. Uh, I don't think I've ever celebrated a match uh, as much. I was going crazy. I was in a uh, a local bar here owned by a Cork guy, Nigel uh, Reardon, and uh, big GA pub, but uh, it was all dubs. And at half time, it was just the atmosphere. There was no atmosphere. Second half, then things started building, then a bottle fell, and then it just started quietening down on myself. And uh, a guy I know uh, from Salt Hill, who was a house out here as well, we were the only two going crazy and oh, all jumped no. around the place. There was oh, actually yeah. a, a, there was a couple of from Cavan uh, in there as well, and they were all shouting on Galway as well. So it was a great on. atmosphere. On, uh, I, 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 typical, I missed it, but anyway, we are where we are. Mm. Brilliant stuff, brilliant stuff. We're really looking forward to getting to chatting to you about the game and what you thought of it. Um, I'll go with Kevin Kennedy. Kevin, how are you? Uh, you fell asleep on me last week. Yes, I'm on mute. Don't worry, I'm coming off now. Thank God, says she. Yes, fell asleep on you last <laughs> week, John. Fell asleep yesterday as well. I think I'm going to have to go and get the blood checked, see what's going on. Um, no, all good, all good. Unfortunately, it's not 30 degree heat here. So I'm looking at Femner with his, uh, his lovely tan about him, going for <laughs> either porridge or beer. I'm not sure. I'm very jealous of him anyway. In a yeah. boat. Yeah, in a boat, in a boat. <laughs> Just don't put the beer in the porridge. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Anything's possible, Kevin. Anything's possible. Anything's possible. Anything's possible after the weekend. Aaron Prendergast, it was going to come around to this. How are you? Yeah, it's going to be a long hour, Sean. I think, <laughs> I think I felt the wrong week to uh, come on. Maybe I should have, I should have sat this one, uh, should have sat this one out or something. But, but uh, yeah, all, all, all Dublin lose on the side. I'm, I'm very well. Like I was away for a few weeks as well. Um, as I was saying to you off air, like I managed to miss like the final twenty minutes of the game. Um, was coming from uh, Vegas to London, and then when I was in London, I got to see a bit of the Armagh Ross Common game, a bit of the Dublin Galway game, thanks to. British Airways delaying our flight and everything else. But then, um, yeah, like there was about a, a 30, 40 minute period up in the air where I knew the game was over, but I didn't know the result. And then as soon as we landed, I checked the score and, um, you know, I, I nearly wanted the pilot to keep going. Do you know what I mean? Like it was like, it was absolutely crazy. But um, no, look, fair play to, to Galway for getting the win. Like they were the deserved victors. Like I think Dublin did very well in the first half and, and certainly in the early part of the second half, but they just completely lost their way. And, Galway grew the the more the game went on, um, and in fairness to Galway, like even in the first half when things were going wrong, they never really panicked. Like Shane Walsh was still knocking points over, Killy McDade was still knocking points over, um, and Dublin just D- Dublin just completely lost their way. And it was a very unlike Dublin performance. Like even watching it back, like watching the final six, seven, eight minutes, it didn't look like I was watching Dublin. Um, like that con chance he misses at the end. How many times did Dublin? Like pull it out of the bag and at least get it to extra time or get a draw, like we saw them do that against Mayo. So yeah, and I think it is the end of an era for for, for Dublin. And I think when you look at it now, Galway have beaten Dublin in the championship this year. Mayo beat them a couple of years ago. Kerry beat them in twenty two. Chris Common drew with us last year. Um, Loud had a good cut, cut at us in in Leinster. Kildare the same last year. So I think Dublin are well and truly back at the pack now and. We're still a very good team, you know. Dublin might come back and win it next year or whatever, but I think the days of Dublin dominating, I think, are certainly a good bit away. Um, and maybe from neutral fans' perspective, that's what uh, that's what people want to see. Well, I, I, it's hard to know, like, is that what people want to see? It's probably more just, you know, you know, let's you know, let's see another probably team winning all Ireland. Like, let's see Kerry winning all Ireland again. Let's see Galway winning all Ireland. Let's see 
Yeah, um, who else? Let's see, Antrim with an All Ireland. Like you know, get let's <laughs> let's let's <laughs> let's get, let's get it back to the pack, Kevy. <laughs> you were flying there, John. You were flying. You were, you were being very uh, empathetic and compassionate towards. It was written on the uh, Tommy Niblock one, saying the iron, you know, and as much as you're comfortable, but <laughs> shit a brick girl with that one. <laughs> oh no, I I I was I was in mid flow there and I had a wee look at you and I said, right, I'll give him a shout out. Lads, we're brilliant stuff. Here. We're <laughs> here. Brilliant stuff. Look at lads, great see as well. Uh, the three of us are in good form on Mr. Prendergast. Uh, I, th- I think, uh, as you said, it's potentially going to be a long podcast. But look, you're a gentleman for jumping on. You're a gentleman scholar for jumping on. I suppose there's only one place to start, lads, on Saturday, the 29th of June, in the All Ireland Senior Football Championship quarter final. It was Dublin against Galway. It was Galway's day. It was Galway's 17 points. Dublin, 16 points. No extra time needed. No penalties needed. Galway got the job done and I'd safely say their last 10 and 15 minutes was an absolute joy to hope behold. Mr. Finian Hanley, take it away. Yeah, God, where do you start? Well, I suppose it's easy to start on, on, on the game, John, because the first half, uh, things were just, it was it was normal course of business really, wasn't it? It was just tipping along. Mannion kicks a, a worldie with the right foot. I heard the commentator saying it's unusual for him to come in, cut in on his right. He normally gets back in on the left. Um, creeps over the bar just you know signs uh, Fenton's point I thought was a sign of we're fucked here <laughs> you know you're in they, uh, maybe another pass maybe you have a shot at goal or whatever it was they were just kind of they were probing a little bit too easy you know um, they they went five up then and it was just it was just but look I suppose the big thing and the big talk from, from talking to people was you know clinging on were the words uh, you know by Galway people mostly we're clinging on we're clinging on we're getting a point you know Shaney kicked one or two great ones um you know Matt like we, we were we were settling when 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 Dublin had you know threatened to pull away we we settled down and you know we kicked the score we won we won some crucial turnovers oh, Sean McCurran was was unbelievable at left half back I thought he was you know, obviously Dylan McHugh is is has been doing it all year, but just a standout performance. I thought Sean Mulcairn just at critical times. Um, you know, we talked a couple of years ago about Jermyn O'Connor for Mayo and that 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 keeping the ball in at the end line. I thought there was one or two moments if you watch the game that when we were, I royally goofed. I thought there was one or two turnovers, one or two moments that just kind of kept us in the game in the first half and gave us a bit of belief that look, it's not pulling. They're not pulling away, pulling away like Dublin do. They normally go eight, nine up and then it's in a half time and then your curtains. But obviously then the second half, first score, Jesus, it was it was just it was just rampant. Whatever was said at half time and there's no better man on the planet to get belief out of guys than Park Joyce. He just makes you six, seven, eight feet taller when you know he's got that knack and that's where he's earning his Horn, you know the setup around him and the coaching and the analysis and all that. But Pork is the guy that you want in a dressing room at half time to really, really just make you believe that we're we're good enough. We're good enough. We have the players, and you know the the great thing. Damien was on. Shane was hanging in there. Sean went off. Like it was so unusual to be losing players like that, and then to still go on and put in the performance. But the bench made a huge impact, and I do think that Daddy oh, will he look back and have regret on starting the boys. It's a very difficult one because if you think of, of 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 players going well in training and Jack McCaffrey has made such an impact, he kind of had to start. But if I think if they left those guys on the bench, Dublin would have won that match. No, no question about that. Um, and I think being in Sligo watching our man Galway and Soupy Campbell coming on and Kieran McGinney could have started Soupy Campbell the last day and he didn't, and the impact he made again. And I don't think if he started the next day, it's just. You know, McKinney is managing the bench really well. And I think if Desi looks back, he may have thought that he should have said, right, lads, look, you're unbelievable. You're flying it. But we need the last 20 minutes here to get over the line. So, look, full credit to our boys. They just played unbelievably out of their skin. They gave it everything in the second half. And they got the, the bit of the break as well. And they deserved it because the work rate was off the charts. It was just it was just a brilliant performance from start to finish. And, you know, there's no one I can't give credit to. You know, the last day, there's, there's nobody that didn't. Even Robert Finity, our own lad, came off. Didn't have his best day, but he didn't have a bad day. He shifted them around the place, you know, at times and got on the ball. So, look, I'm I'm, I'm thrilled. They played unbelievably. And, uh, you know, big one coming in a couple of weeks' time. Talk about big ones coming. Kevin McGarty, my God. 
<laughs> Where the hell have you been, my man? Great to see you back in the pod. How are you? <laughs> Can't hear you, big man. Good start. <laughs> this is box office. There we go. Hope uh, I'm top of the world, man. Look at the smile and Finny and Han on his face. It's his way. It is Galway Bay. Oh my God! Look at that. You oh know, man, um, it's holiday time, Kevin. Aaron, well, it's hol- holiday time. I don't know what he's. Uh, don't know what he's thinking at the minute. Um, oh geez, the Galway race is coming up too, Finny. You'll be making a pretty penny in the next couple of weeks, I'd say. <laughs> I'll just answer the questions, Kevin. That's all I'll do. Oh, that's all. I'll just answer the questions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, great. Good man, it's all about the Benjamins, boy. As they say in New York City, it's all about the Benjamins. <laughs> Definitely. Mr. McCurdy, how are you? You keeping well? Yeah, I'm alive. Um, I'm great. I'm, I'm actually looking forward to talking about this weekend. Uh, so the boys will know, and I can't wait for Aaron. Andrew Grass to start, he's going to rib me. I got two out of four, you know. And, uh, <laughs> That's all good. We'll go easy on Generally, you. Generally, that. Uh... Oh, well, okay, Aaron, I'll go easy on you after after <laughs> the dubs. You know, you've had a good few years yet. You know, so leave Finney and leave Finney and in his uh his hour of glory. Um, no, it, it was an interesting weekend of football, John. I wouldn't say it was overly um great in terms of uh skill level or what we were looking to see of four great games, quarterfinals. But look, really in. The talk. It's about our energy in management. You know, I finally got over that side, shoulder of quote, final stuff. Uh, Gaul was blown away by Galway's second half performance. I don't know if you've seen the second half in from anything. They were incredible. Um, I really can't wait to hear Penny's thoughts on that. Um, and, and unfortunately, me and Kev are just the stat man. That's all we have to come. Andrew, once again, blown away. So, always abides, mate. You know? Yeah, yeah. Your connection's a bit dodgy there, Kevy. Come on, we, we, we need to see the full of you tonight. Mr. Hanley, obviously, very good kind of points regarding that. I suppose, what, the, the kind of regarding that, you know, the, the goal of a performance, and, you know, obviously, we did kind of say the week leading into it, you know, with, with Damien Comer and Shane Walsh, but, you know, the, the need for Galway to have them on the pitch at the same time, obviously, two you know, serious, serious men. They can b- really bring that goal routine to serious places, but like the impact Shane Walsh had in that first half, he was remarkable. Yeah, yeah, he was, John. And, and look, we were, we were talking before the match, um, the week leading up to the match about Shane and 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 and, and talking to player, past players and lads, you know, in and around the around the place for the last while. That this was the type of game that Shane loves. Do you know what I mean? He loves like the All Ireland final in twenty two. You know, Shane mightn't show up against. Westmead or 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 or, or Sligo or you know in a, in a in a lesser game we'll say but the big day he just seems to love that you know and and the fact that it was Dublin he's playing for a Dublin club all that sort of stuff he just he relishes that he just doesn't have this he 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 doesn't feel that much pressure um you know when he's a bad game it's not down to over over exerting himself or pressure it's just it's just maybe maybe trying to do too much, but 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 he he, he loves that arena. So on Saturday first half, like the the, the one where Dean Darcy got the ball into the corner and 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 and, and gave it to Shane, it was just it was just jinking over the bar. Like like I know it was John Small had a little slip, but you know it was like arrow like over the bar into the hill. It was just a tonic for 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 Galway because straight away Dublin are thinking. Fucking he's on it. <laughs> uh, this is uh, reminiscent of of, of twenty two All Ireland that. Those sort of scores. So, look, he was he he was brilliant in the first half and really kept 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 Galway in it. So, um, now look, he's 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 under pressure now for two weeks time because of of his leg. He came on, came off against Monaghan. What's wrong with him? I actually don't know. Um, uh, what what the injury is, but it's obviously not good because he's been he's been really trying his best to stay on the pitch and he, he seems doesn't seem to be able to. So, um, it's a worry because in a big game coming up and. It's gonna be it's gonna be tight. It's gonna be a good tight game, not like what Kerry and Derry was. It's going to be a tussle. This is because 
you know, it'd be, it'd be highly defensive. Two very good defensive teams, uh, Galway and Donegal. So, you know, you'll need moments of magic if you can get that space, which I think we will get because, you know, obviously Lau got a lot of space against Donegal. You'll need Shane on the end of those balls. So, like he was on Saturday, but uh, he really stood up. He really stood up. And, you know, when other lads, Sean had gone off and, and Damo had gone, uh, Damo was quieter and Robert was quiet as well. You just needed the guy and, and, and look, he's got all the tools, all the accessories to, to do it as well. So, but he was fantastic. Yeah. Any kind of points in relation to that, uh, Kevy McGarty, in relation to kind of Finian, what Finian was saying there? You're mute there, big man. <clears throat> Shane Walsh's first goal was absolutely orgasmic, set the tone really for the day, end of the hill. Um, look, the coconuts he showed, you know, everything he went through, big day for the big man, he stood up. But I mean, I think Finian, in terms of the overall, I think most of the guys will admit he comes away with the plaudits. I think he scored not seven in the end. And people look at that game, but really, it was the sum of all parts for Galway that really got me. Um, like when I look at this, McDee, Shane Walsh, um, to a lesser extent, Matthew Tierney, Conroy, McHugh, the work that them lads got through was incredible. You know, obviously, Shane. Um, scores even even Comer went in friendly possession in there to lay it off or or get you know to contribute to scores was fantastic. But I want for you to look back for me this game changed. If we look at 11 7 at half time, I think even Finian being the most ardent Galway fan in the world will will argue that probably Galway was lucky enough to be in the game at half time still. And uh, the game for me hinges. Between the 41st and the 43rd minute, I, I just watched it back actually before it came on here. And it's Sean Fitzgerald gets the block in when um, the goal is gaping for Con O'Callaghan. Now, on another day, Con might have thought, wisely, I'll knock it over the bar, put another nail in their coffin. It's 12 9, I believe, at that stage. Mm -hmm. He gets a block in, and automatically, Galway go down the field. I'm not too sure if they score a point or it's a way, but from whatever comes off the kick out, it's the first kick out that Dublin lose uh, and, and Galway turn it over and get a score. So all of a sudden, it could have been 112 or even 13 points to nine. It ends up 12 10. And Galway got a re if you actually listen to the crowd at that stage, Doxon's kick out is turned over and the crowd goes absolutely berserk. And Galway get a big, big lift from it. And, you know, I, I put it into the group last night. Dublin win 22 out of 24 tickets. Who in the second period, uh, in, in, in second half, turnovers and Galway get scores from both of them. Um, so for me, it was the sum of all parts for Galway. The mm -hmm. so one thing I'd be really worried about Galway, and I'm really interested to hear the lads read, but particularly Finian, who's played in there in, in, in sort of, you know, in the hot tub, if you want to put it that way. In the full back line, I thought Galway looked really susceptible to the quick ball early on. You know, um, Paul Mannion started like a house on fire. You know, mm. there seemed to be real problems getting the grips with Con O'Callaghan. I am absolutely sure that Donny Gall will be looking at a video this week and saying, get good early ball in because Galway did look susceptible to, uh, there. They grew into the game very much like the Derry game a couple of years ago in the semi final when they won. They didn't start very well. But they grew into the game in the second half. Sorry, I should you also mention through the through the the amount of work that went on in, in terms of the players early on. Uh, John Maher at centre forward get through a pile of work as well. Um, so I mean, uh, for me, well deserved win. Much hungrier to outscore the Ireland champions by five in the second half. Um, you know, Paul Mannion, even though he started well, he was taken off. Um, also, I think another stat, Kevin, will keep me probably right on this. Of the six starting forwards for Dublin, five of the six that started scored. Um, you know, so you know, go uh, Dublin seemed there did seem to be an attacking threat there, but on the flip side, of that, you know, give all the praise in the world to go away. But this is the best thing we've seen probably ever in the GA. And I thought, you know, he, he's a brilliant guy, and you know, he's done so much for the GA, and in particular in Dublin, you know, all the stuff for the GP and stuff. But, I thought Desi Farrell on the line was trying really, really wanted. Um, and that we just that we just say, you know, a couple of things I picked up. John Small's absolutely cleaned out. Absolutely cleaned out. 
and there wasn't a chance made quick enough there to interact with Shane Watson, no matter how good a player he is, which he, he's brilliant. You know, that wasn't done quick enough. For me, Mike Fitzsimmons, um, Finney and I know this very well because he coaches him, obviously. Rob Finnerty is, is a top, top quality forward, but Mike Fitz done a, a cracking job, absolutely brilliant job on him. I mean, Rob, I don't know if he was injured or not, but he was he was called ashore. Why wasn't Mick Fitz put across the sooner? Um, you know, Colin Basquiat. I mean, I don't know if Colin, again, speaking ignorantly, I don't know if Colin Basquiat is coming into the game with an injury. But I mean, when you have an asset like that and you're not playing him, I don't know what's going on. So, for as good as Galway were, I give them all the credit in the world um, for what they did. I think Dublin, there's a couple of discussions that we had about the changes that could have been made earlier. Finian, I'm aware you're stuck. How are you fixed the time there, Finian? I'm all right, yeah. I'm okay. Happy days, happy days. Any kind of thoughts on Kevin's points there, Mr. Kennedy? Um, yeah, he touched on something there just around about the whole, the part of the, you know, rather than the individuals, it definitely came down to the whole. I mean, if you look at Galway throughout this year, Galway are probably a team who have been depleted an awful lot throughout the league with the injuries, and that has come to benefit them in the long run. Unlike Gary, who maybe over the last two years have stuck to 15, 17 players at the most, Galway were forced to use an extended panel this year, having you know, maybe, I don't know, many players got used in the league, 25, 26, 27, because they were forced to. But every one of them players, it's brought them on. It's brought on their football, and that's why they're able all to come on and contribute. Kevin's touched on there around about the, the slow start. And Galway aren't a team who score high. I mean, Galway aren't going to go out and score 22 points in a game. Dublin scored 22 points against them in the league. And at half time, Dublin were nailed on to get 22 points. You know, 11 points in, halfway through the game, you thought there was going to be 22 points in it again. But they did get their, their house sorted and they got their defensive structures a lot better. And it goes back to the point of saying we don't we don't raise the level of our goals, we fall to the level of our systems. And Galway have an absolutely fantastic defensive system that goes on in there and keeps them in games. It kept them in the game in the second half. They nearly got out of it in the first half. The game was nearly over for them. But some of the scores from Balls to Kevin's already touched on, Finney's already touched on, were absolutely fantastic. You know, it remained you back down in the, the 2022 shootout between um, Kerry and Galway. And that, you know, what better place to show them the group than, than Crow Park? But yeah, it was, I thought that, you know, from Kevin touched on it there, I put it into the WhatsApp group. I was surprised at the changes. I've never in the last 15 years heard of Dublin starting with only five natural forwards bringing Cap Jack McCaffrey in there. There was something else going on that, you know, a bit of fear or a bit of worry about Comer, who, was, who by his own standards, didn't have a good game. But he's, he'll come on from it. Shane Walsh was fantastic. They 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 were almost on Dublin Lake, and now there was a bit of fear going on there. There was something going on in there to say, we have to change what we normally do. And the day of a game is not the time you do that. You stick to what you know. Galway have stuck to what they've known throughout the year, and that's why every one of their players know what way they play football inside it. But it was a great, a, a great game. Thought it was over at half time. Galway fought their way back into it, and I suppose the biggest thing for Galway is that they deserve a two week break now. They deserve a two week break. What if you can get those players fit and ready and rested in two weeks? I fancy them against Donny Galway. I do. I think that it's you know it's David Goliath clashing. It's two different stages of football here, and Donny Galway will not hit one twenty two against Galway. Not a chance of it. Hmm. Mr. Hanley. Yeah, a couple of points on that. I think just to go back to Kevy's um uh point there on 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 the turnover, the the, the kick out, uh, two points. Sorry, the kick out was Damian Comer. That turnover, that was the Jeremy O'Connor like moment I was talking about from when Jeremy O'Connor was it against Dublin when he kept the ball in the end line. That was just he dived on Tuxton's kick out just to get it. I think we got a score out of it. It was just. It was just he had a, the game wasn't for Damien. It wasn't Damien's game on 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 Saturday. But that that shows you need your big players to do something big. And that was a huge. It wasn't a score. It wasn't a catch. It was just a turnover. That shows where Galway are at and the belief that's in the in the group for everyone to muck in when you really really need it. And that's how you win these big matches when you've got that level of intensity all over the pitch. You know, and and, and the reason teams have won the All Ireland over the last while. Whilst there's been some brilliant players on offer, there's been absolute marquee moments from the John Smalls, from the Ty Morley, from the you know what I mean, the the you know even in Tyrone, just just those sort of things that 
just, you know, you don't see them on the highlights of the Sunday game, but they're just absolutely critical at critical times. And the second thing is, I think Galway's backs at the minute, we have a lot of, I suppose, they be cornerbacks by trade, uh, like like five of our backs. So we're Johnny McGrath, Sean Fitzgerald, um, Liam Silk, Sean Mulkern's a fullback. They've all played, I think most of them have played fullback for Galway over the last four or five years, which is unusual to have that amount of players that have played as inside backs playing. Uh, you know, I think Dylan McHugh's the only one that hasn't played in there. So we have a lot of defenders that can get in and get turnovers once we set up. And I think the work that's been done around the middle when you've got Keen Darcy, you've got John Maher, you have a lot of, I want to say, un Galway like players. You know, for years and years and years, we picked wing forwards because they were wing forwards and, 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 and Galway were the slowest team to adapt to modern football. You know, post the Jim McGuinness start, we'll say we, we were the slowest because the fans wouldn't allow it. Um, and just it just wasn't allowed in Galway. And even when Kevin Walsh did it, he was, he was ran because in the end, it was just we want to go back to type. We tried that, but we have a defensive system now. We're not afraid to put 15 behind the ball. But when we do, we've got really good cornerbacks all over the place that can put in hard tackles. And John Mara puts, I, I, I think he epitomizes the work rate of Galway at the minute. You know, he chased down everything the Fenton did. He just, he just does that work. And we, 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 we were, are, we, we were, we think of number 11s in the game, lads, going back. Number 11s in the game were predominantly Kieran McDonald's and Jeremy McConnelly's and all these classy players. That position is gone. Mm. It's gone. It's, unfortunately, now unfortunately. it's the new wing forward. Mm. It's absolute dog dog of a, of a job in the middle of the pitch to get up and down that middle, set up attacks and, and defend. And I think we did that brilliantly the last day when, when needed. So, um. And you're right, uh, Kevin Kennedy, you know, hit the nail on the head. You know, the the subs and the players that we've had to use throughout the league. I I, I said it during the league, we were in a good place. When I saw the players that were playing, like Limo Canela came on on the last day. He's a young, young, young kid. Uh, you know, ki- you know, Killian O'Curran to play in the league. Loads of guys have played in the league. And whether we liked it or not, it has stood to us big time. I can't agree more. It's just stood to us big time because now we've got players that can come on and, and they're used to the, the, the hustle and we're not always, when Damien's off a bit, other guys stand up and we still have huge experience in Johnny Heaney, you know, you know, Killian McDade and these guys to step up as well. But there's a there's a plethora of guys. Carl Sweeney was out the last day injured. He'll be back the next day. Really, really good, quick player as well. So, um, it's really stood to us. So I, I'm I'm hoping that we still need those injured guys back uh, and fully fit for to beat Donegal. I think, but you know, it's 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 there's huge positivity around Galway at the moment. Well said, Finn. Well said. I suppose Aaron. I suppose thoughts on Dublin. I suppose the fallout from everything now, and I suppose Desi Farrell's future, Stephen Cloak's future, Mick Simon's future, James McCarry's future, so on and so forth. So, I suppose general thoughts on Dublin going forward now, Mister Prendergast. Yeah, well, I suppose <clears throat> Kev probably hit the nail earlier on in the head. Like, I, I don't really know. I thought some of the decisions from from Desi Farrell and, and Dublin were really strange. Um, like starting with James McCarthy, starting with Jack McCaffrey. Like both of those two hadn't been starting all year. Like Jack McCaffrey hasn't been fit really since coming back into the Dublin team. Like he's had a lot of injury issues. So the fact that he came back in and started, I thought was a little bit a little bit unusual. Um only going with five forwards as well was a little bit unusual. First half was was very, very good. I, I was very impressed with Dublin. I thought it was one of our best performances, probably up until up until the second half. Um we kept hitting the rec ball into Con O'Callaghan, like one or two catches was absolutely superb. Some of his points were brilliant. Cormac Costello was carrying on carrying on his form from the Mayo game. Brian Fenton was looking good. I think we just lost our way in the second half. And I think we I think it was a mix of poor decisions from Desi Farrell and also probably a bit of complacency as well. Like Noel Scully was having an absolute stormer for Dublin and then Desi Farrell takes him off and it looked almost like that was prearranged. Um almost saving him for a for a semi final. So um, I think we lost our way. Like James McCarthy had one chance that he put wide, um, which was very unusual, very unlike him. Um, we we kept getting turned over. I think Galway started to grow more and more in the in the game as well. They started to get a bit more confident the more that the game went on. Um, and and yeah, from a Dublin perspective, it was just the decision making was poor from from management as well. Like I think Basquel isn't really an impact sub. I think he's more of a starter. In, in all honesty, and I would have liked to seen. Uh, Jack McCaffrey coming off the bench rather than starting. Um, I think Paddy Small didn't really 
make much of an impact coming off the bench as well. Ross McGarry didn't really either. And we just got caught. And as I said before, John, like last year, I remember saying before, like I, I didn't think Dublin were that great in all honesty up until about the quarterfinals. You know, we drew at Ross Common. We, we nearly got beat by Kildare. Um, like this isn't the same Dublin that won six in a row. Do you know what I mean? Like a lot of the older lads have slowed down. Um, you know, we didn't win the All Ireland in twenty one and twenty two. We definitely are back in the in the pack now. Like Galway have beaten us, Mayo have beaten us recently, Kerry have beaten us. Um, we've had a couple of other close games here and there. Loud gave a cu- good cut at us, obviously in the Leinster final. So, um, yeah, I think we're well and truly back at the pack and. You know, even at that, like I think Theo Clancy was having an excellent year throughout the league and uh, Mick Fitzsimons comes straight back in. So, yeah, I think there's going to be big changes. I would say Fitzsimons, McCarthy, um, I think Cluxton will probably go. I think Colin Parkinson said on his podcast earlier that he reckons Brian Fenton's going to retire as well. So uh, I think I think there's going to be a huge amount of um, of changes. Could Desi Farrell go? Could Jerry Brennan come in? You know, I think there's going to be a lot of very interesting changes. Yeah, Brian Fenton. Ah, Fenton is another three years, I'd say. Mm. Couple of years. I, I, I would say Brian Fenton would would stay as well. Um, oh no, he's thirty. He's thirty two next March, so I, I would ah. say he'll have another few years. But mm. um, whether Parkinson knows someone, you know, or has someone in the know, I, I don't really know. Do you know? Do you know that way? Yeah, when, when, when you said Colin Parkinson there, uh, Aaron, I think that I, 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 I nearly lost belief. I nearly lost belief. Changes ahead, Mister McGarty, and that Dublin setup. Yeah, lots. Um, I think it's time for a refresh. Um, Daisy probably knows the writing's on the wall from, I would think. Um, and the furnace he's won two All-Irons. He's had a cut at it. Um, look, I, I do think the older statesmen will go. They leave the scene as John Kavanagh rightly said last night with their heads held high. Terrific, terrific servants to Dublin and in furnace to the GA. Um Fenton would be an interesting one. Actually, that's a that's a real interesting one because a couple of years ago, even though he's a, you know we know he's a doctor and he's a heavy scas and he was working overseas and stuff. The year Jack McCaffrey, the first year he took out, when he came back, he was a he was he was just so refreshed. Fenton's been on the road. He's got a lot a lot of miles on the clock. You know, you have to remember this lad came into a Dublin team who were ready to top. You know, and maybe maybe he needs a winter off. Maybe he needs, if someone's a manager's coming in and you to Dublin, maybe he needs to say to him, look, do yourself a favour, take yourself off to the South Seas, do something else, do something different. You know, go play squash or racquetball for a couple of months and then come back in and uh, and, and really freshen yourself up. Um, because, you know, mentally, physically, he's been he's been on the road a long time. Here in Kilkenny, he's another interesting debate. He's been around maybe the same as Fenton, maybe a, a year or two longer. Aaron will be able to tell us that. But I do see changes coming, um, massive changes. Now, the interesting one is who does come in. Because it was Jared Brennan, again, a guy he, who will bring Niall Morning in with him, no doubt, who's with him at Mayo. One guy's at DCU, the other guy's at UCD, two professional guys in terms of sport. Who, that's their day-to-day jobs. Um, you know, they know, they have their finger in the pulse and everything that's happening in Dublin football. They know everybody playing Sigerson, minor, under 20, school level, everything like that. So that would be a no-brainer. It's maybe if Dublin want to go outside, it might be a wee bit different to shake things up. Um, and the other thing is as well, we talked about this on, in, our, in our group WhatsApp, Dublin schools haven't been overly successful in the likes of the Hogan Cup. You know, under age this last number of years, they've been found a wee bit wanting for the size of population that they have. So, I mean, that's interesting in terms of the conveyor belt. Obviously, they, are, they have a large population, lots of clubs, lots of guys who are who are participating in our games, and that will never be a problem. But, you know, underage-wise, compared to some other counties, maybe like Kerry, to a lesser extent, they won't. Um, they maybe haven't as been, been as prevalent. So, look, it's going to be a long winter in the capital. Um, a lot of soul-searching to be done. Um, but I certainly do think it's the end of an era. And the next manager has got, excuse my language, has got to be a ruthless motherfucker. Because what happened over the last 10 years, it ain't going to do next year. So does he then bring out the knife? And does he call the likes of Mannion? Does he call the likes of, you know, lads that don't retire? He needs to get You know, if it's Daisy or if it's somebody coming in you, they've just got to be ruthless. Because that 
And I say this with all due respect to them lads in that team. I think that is now history. Um, and in your year back in Sir Dublin GA, that's just my my view on. There you go. What do you think, Mister Kennedy? Um, yeah, I think that you know the fact that McCarthy started shows that Dublin have not been able to fill that void in midfield. You know, it was Brian Hard last year who was him and Fenton in the middle of the brilliant. They obviously have a worry about there, and they haven't the players to slip in and replace them, which is why they've had to rely on um those boys coming back in. But yeah, change is inevitable, isn't it? They haven't got it right this year. They didn't get over the line this year. There'll be change. Um, it may be a bit of time interest. I was at a talk with Belfast not so long ago, and Jim Galvin mentioned this after the Loud and Dublin game, actually, it was in the Leicester final. Someone had said about Dublin's dominance, and Jim Galvin had sort of made a comment like, will it go on? And will it go on in Louds for much longer as well? Um, after he, he sort of went after today's performance, you know. Um, things aren't the, as clear cut as it might be. So maybe there's a some spark of they come back into the Leicester Championship in the next year or two. We could see Lowe's this in the, the cup next year. I don't know. But yeah, change is inevitable. It's gonna happen. It has to happen. All the good teams change and evolve, and it's just Dublin doing that transition by remaining at the, the top of the game as well. Absolutely. Mr. Hanley. Yeah, I wouldn't be as pessimistic for Dublin as the boys would be to be honest like, <laughs> I still I fucking I still think there's some like uh-huh. Lee Gannon's a Lee Gannon's a good player he's a good footballer I think he he was a loss now Aaron might tell me different but I think he was a fucking loss to Dublin this year and I, Kieran Kilkenny has I, I know comes to Galway a lot and he's one player he raves about all the time saying look he just cut the head off yeah he's the type of guy that we he's the you know, you know, Davy Byrne was gone as well. They were missing a couple of guys who've just been kind of there the last couple of years that have have, have brought a bit more energy to it that replaced some some you know the Philly McMahons of this world. I just think I, I, I don't think it will be a huge transition. I think they'll try, they'll be okay. Like Killian McGuinness, there's there's some good footballers there that will step up quicker than we 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 would like. I think I I don't think they're gonna they're gonna head off into the sunset for a couple of years. That's not gonna happen. I think they'll uh, it, it, the likes of Joe Brennan, as he said, he knows the game in Dublin. I just don't think it's as it's as bad as what people think. And and yesterday, uh, geez, in the first hour, sorry, what day is today? Uh, Monday, okay. uh, Saturday, Saturday. Uh, first half, they were playing some good football. They kicked eleven points against this Galway defense. You know that hasn't, you know, doesn't concede a lot, doesn't score a lot, but um, you know, and they, they, you know, they they were in for a couple of chances, missed a goal chance. Fenton could have went on. You know, we hung in there, and 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 adrenaline got us over the line. But I don't think we comfortably went to Dublin on Saturday and beat beat the Dubs and finished the careers of the greatest footballers of all time. I don't think we did. Uh, to be quite honest, um, I'd be I'd be wary about saying that about them because they'll come back and they'll absolutely fuck us all next year again. But uh, <laughs> um, I still think there's good footballers in Dublin. If Desi goes. Two All Irelands, it's not bad innings. We won two in in fifty eight years, so yes, yeah, so it does. Yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, it's not a bad, it's not a bad return. Do you know what I mean? He has blooded some guys. Yeah. There is, you know, Adele. There's some, there's some guys there that are very, very young that will come through. So, uh, it's not, it's not, it's not all bad for Dublin, in my yeah. uh, no, very, very, natural, very limited opinion. <laughs> no, it'd be natural wastage, natural wastage in our boys. Um, but with the idea, the idea of that steps away is mod. I think. I don't think that's, you know, that's, but, that's yeah. a very bad shout. Yeah. Um, Kilkenny could be there. You know, all, all these, I think the natural ways he's a call maybe from Cluxton just with the age, maybe Rick Fitz just with the age and stuff like that. McCarthy, that's all. I don't think it's a whole call and all of a sudden they're back in the, well, aren't they? We're not playing them in the year after the next poll again. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and in fairness to those boys, like the time is 35. Yeah. Like, you can't be playing in a full back line, American Damien Comer at 30. You can barely play. Corner forward at thirty five. Don't mind the fucking full back line. Uh, I'm marking the likes of Shane Walsh and, and and Robbie and these guys. They're still kind of doing it, and they could have pissed off last year with nine All Irelands. Do you know what I mean? At the top, but they're they're gone for the ten. And in fairness to them, like, oh, funny, funny. And there's a there's a fella from Portugal called Pepe, and he's forty one and playing rightly. You know. <laughs> yeah, but he's on a fucking two hundred grand a year, Kevin. For fuck's sake, he, he's uh, not he's weak. Not a weak. Kevin, 
A week. He's a bit of an, a a bit of an animal week. too. But, yeah, know. yeah, no, there is. But no, I mean, I, like, like it's 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 cut. It's it's cutthroat. Is what I'm saying. Fluxton is forty. I know goals is different, but no, like, I'm not saying the limbs start to ache. You know the skin. <laughs> no, we no, know. No. We know this. The, the, fucking, can... I can barely get out of the fucking swimming pool. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I have two <laughs> brand new 2025 knees coming. McCarty's at the ship is life. McCarty's at the ship is life. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm going to play after once every other week, boy. Um, no, I, I, I didn't mean to come across as sort of this is, you know, dark, doom and gloom. Don't get me wrong. I think, Finney, you, you do make a good point. I mean, if you look at Bugler, if you look at Lurk and Odell, if you look at um, Le Hef, you know, these lads have slowly been blooded in, you know, um, over the last number of years. But when you're starting about 43, okay, it's a goalkeeper to specialized position. You're starting about 35, only got 34. Um, and you're telling me there's not better footballers in Dublin in terms of now at the minute. Don't, don't get me wrong, their experience is, is phenomenal. Um, and, you know, the other thing is then you make that decision that I think, you know, on hit the nail on the head. Jack McCaffrey for me right now, if I'm managing Dublin, I'm going to him and saying at the start of the season, look Jack, I need you fit for nothing but 20 minutes. I need five serious runs off you. You're an impact there and that's what you are for me now. Whereas you're going to some of the younger lads who you're bringing in, you know, the likes of Bugger and these guys and you're saying, look, you're, you're a 50, 60 minute man for me. Um, so I'm not trying in any way to, to get, get them all out the door. I'm, I'm trying to be realistic and say, that some time or other, if, if, if he does step aside, which I do expect, if I'm honest, the new guy's got to come in and he's got to put his own stamp on it and his own mark on it and he's got to be ruthless in doing it. And sometimes we see managers come in and you read autobiographies and whatever else they're saying, you know, maybe it was too, especially a guy who's played with some of the other guys that comes in, maybe his manager, I was too, maybe, um, I was too loyal to my own teammates or too loyal to those that have done things before. You've, you've really got to be ruthless in a management game. And, you know, the game, that Dublin team has now moved on. I think that's the sign of it. I think Donegal are coming in a new big time. We'll talk about that in a minute. I think certainly Kerry are always there. I think Verona have come back into their box now and certainly will rebuild over the next two, three years. And, and Dublin need to really sit down and look at where they're at. And I don't think where they're at is, is with them older lads, if I'm honest with you. And that's the wonder, Kev. That's the wonder with with what happened the last couple of weeks. Was there like you know, loyal foot soldiers there that won all Ireland's for you? And Desi has Jack and James McCarthy and these guys. And was the conversation? Look, you know I'm good for it, Desi. Get me in there. I played well. Get me in the get me get me starting on this team, and I'll, I'll do the business or whatever it is for you. And did he succumb to that and go, you know what, fuck it, they've done it for me before. I know what they're made of. They'll do it again or whatever it was. So maybe that, where, where, whereas Jim Gavin, Jim Gavin never dropped anyone really. He rosterized them. <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's like you're working in a bar or something and all of it, you're working seven days a week, then you're working six, then you're not getting a shift at all for no reason. You've just been taken off the roster unknown to yourself. That's the way he managed the Jeremy Connollys and these guys and the Bernard Brogans, that's how, it, you know, he didn't get rid of them, he kept them there, but it was on his terms and that's why he was, you know, I believe Aaron, the, the greatest manager, man manager and all that. It wasn't to do with the tactics or anything like that. He was just able to do that and he had the respect to do that and he had the balls to do it as well. So, you know, maybe that happened, maybe it didn't, but it's just it's it's, it's just something to kind of mull over over the next while to see where, where, where they're really at. Yeah. And just to, like not to prolong that, John, but I remember being in Dublin speaking to a guy who very, very high profile in Irish school in terms of performance. He's worked with the Irish rugby team. He now works with Alexa PWC and people like that in terms of, you know, getting the maximization of and I knew he was working with Dublin. I was having a chat with him one day and you know, this was at the height of the Jim Galvin year. And he was saying, yeah, I was like, Jeremy Connolly's really buzzing. He says, you think he's buzzing? Conor Costello's playing out of his skin. And so Colin Basquiat. And the two of them couldn't get inside the team. You know, he just had everybody jumping. And everybody was under pressure. And, you know, we, obviously we're on the outside and we're really speculating. But, you know, there can be no place in any terms in modern sport. The more I read about it, the more you read autobiographies or whatever else. There can be no place for sentiment. You have to be a ruthless person. And we'll come on, and probably the most ruthless person I've ever seen in the GA is back working in the GA, and there's no doubts. 
that the turnaround in Donegal is probably due to him being so ruthless. Mm. And that's me getting. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. We're looking forward to seeing what Donegal have to do for the rest of this All Ireland series. Finian, have you had enough of us yet? <laughs> nearly, nearly. <laughs> Donegal, Donegal, Donegal. We need to pick them up before I go. Brilliant stuff, brilliant stuff. Suppose yeah, we, we can we can touch on to that game before if you want no bother, gents. Uh Donegal against Loud lads in the All Ireland Senior Football Championship quarter final. It was Donegal 123, Loud 18 points. Uh, probably a bit of an error of inevitability about how this game is going to finish up and it turned on it out, turned out just like that. At stages you thought Loud could have had a real go with this, but it looked like they were happy to only get by bet by four or five points. Hard to know, Mr. Hanley. Yeah, look, it is it, it, business. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed by Donegal. I think the Cork game was a was a, was a glitch. Um, just put off the gas a little bit. Um, and 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 they knew they had Clare in the last game or whatever. But I think the Clare game for me, the Donegal Clare game was exceptional. The score they put up and Tony concede five points is 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 unheard of. Um, and 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 the last day again, whilst they conceded a lot and they did leave themselves on Donegal like at the back, I think around the D there was a good bit of space, which I would hope is there the next day because we have, you know, the shooters and the runners that can really expose that. But um it was a little bit open the last day. I I, I think Jim again has touched on it after the game. He wasn't overly happy with the levels of space that Loud were getting up front and they got thirty eight shots off or something. Kevin might correct me, but um uh, scored eighteen, I I think. Um, like that's big shooting um, uh, in a game that's like a challenge match really but they scored 123 and, and and the ease in which they went forward their efficiency going forward they're like a team that's playing by numbers at the minute that they're saying look if we get enough ta- attacks within the D and we get enough shots off we'll score 124 might concede 17 or 18 but fuck it we're going to score more than the opposition once we get into these positions and they're intricate they're passing they're, they're one two. It's just, it's just, it's it's an unbelievable story, really. It's it's like if Tony Gall beat Galway the next day and goes to one All Ireland final, whatever. Forget about the final for now, but like this is our elite sport. This is our sport, right? This is elite sport. So it's it's elite sport in 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 GAA, right? So you've got elite sport in soccer, which is Premier League. You've got you've got your American football and everything like that. You can't tell me that Bill Belichick or Pep Guardiola or Kareem Abdul-Jabbar or any of these high profile managers who've done great things have done anything like what Jim McGuinness is possibly could possibly have do with Johnny Gall this year. It's off the fucking charts. Oh it is, yeah. Yeah, compared it, to last it, year, it, like it, it, at this time last year it's a completely different conversation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm ta- I'm talking globally now. I'm talking this guy is yeah. going to be the greatest manager, Gaelic football manager, I, I bar none, and one of the greatest sporting managers in the world if he pulls this off. This is off, like, yeah, yeah. Patrick McBrearty is walking around shadow of the man he was and whatever they're getting out of these players is off, is off, off the Richter scale. Now, look, they could lose and again be back, but I'm just saying the possibility mm. of, of this story is, is is unbelievable and I am bigging them up because I hope they fall hard uh, <laughs> so but, that's uh, why he's just after saying what he said for fuck's but, sake but Jesus I, I don't Christ know the, I don't know what the lads think but he's oh, unreal this will be this will be off the charts if they get Be-ge- this done Kev McGarty you're after listening to the biggest spiel uh, did you hear any of that it's, it's the truth I haven't had a drink yet I can only I, I can only I can only imagine yeah, he's after saying if if if, if, McGuinness, if McGuinness wins the All Ireland, he's the greatest manager to ever manage in management and sport. He's bigger than a big time. I I, I think the achievement. <laughs> is, I think the achievement is, is right, up though. there. I, I I don't think other managers in other sports would have pulled off a turnaround with the le- players that he has and where they were. Given yeah, the it's, Dublin's, it's, the Galways, the poor Joyce has been five years there. Kieran McGinley's been ten years there. This is off the wall this guy I met him in Dublin after the Galway Kerry match we were in the hotel and we ended up sitting with them for the night and myself and Gareth Bradshaw ended up sitting with Jim McGuinness and we were heading for town obviously to have a couple of beers never got to town three hours there was chairs been moved there was uh, salt shakers been put on the table telling us about how six falls into defence the split defence for with soccer and how it moves into GAA it was absolutely riveting. I was going, yeah. fucking hell. He's a top class going, man. 
it, it just his but, level of thinking is off the charts. Uh, yeah, but even like any uh, any off the ball interviews he's done after games, like literally you see all the journalists and like it's just like listen listening to him as I like I'd love to. I'd love to have like a night with Jim McInnes. I think it'd be well worth value. And even Ryan McHugh and uh, Jim McInnes were doing the aftermath interview after the game. Yes, and Ryan McHugh just looked at him like he was like the savior. And oh, my God, he is the savior year, Mister Kennedy. Yeah, like he's done a wonderful job. Everything has felt right. Not not just because they've got players back, but obviously the environment in terms of the culture that Jim McInnes brings. He done it well his first time. He's went away to professional sports. Listen to even some of the podcasts and Neil Lennon stuff, some of the ideas given to these people who run these sort of stuff professionally. Um, he's obviously grew over the last 10 years in terms of his own database, his own knowledge, and how the game works and operates. But I think Finney has touched on a lot of things there in terms of the hype and the, the sentiment and the Jim McGuinness factor. And for me, John, you'll be used to me saying this. I think Donegal have looked at the dairy model and they've looked at the Glen model. And it is a case of shoot by numbers. And what he's brought into that team, the accuracy is to be absolutely unreal but they've also had times through this year go back to their court game in the very first game they've had times this year where their accuracy hasn't been there but they've went in this idea of shoot and shoot often their phases of play last less than a minute that means they're getting in 30 32 38 shots in a game if you're getting 50 percent of 38 it's bringing you up near 20 points in the game if you get on like Derry, who changed their their way of playing they went in more conservative plays if you're only hitting 20 shots again you have to get 70% accuracy just to hit 14 points. So what Donegal have done is created this environment whereby it shoot, shoot on site and don't be afraid of shooting. You even seen Potter mm-hmm. Mullen. Some of those scores he was taken, many other teams, many other players would have carried that, put those balls in another five or six yard, get them in close to the D and then pop them over. Not with Donegal. They have worked on it, no doubt that it's shoot and shoot as often as possible. I do think people have fallen in. I don't think Galway will do this. He even watched it against Lloyd. Not 18 is a lot to concede. Not 18 is a lot to concede. So there's there's stuff to go on there with it. But I don't think Galway will fall into this idea whereby everyone believes that Donegal are a goal-scoring machine. Because they're not really. They're not a goal-scoring machine. Up until they score four goals in the Derry game. And they only score, in one game, they score four goals. In the whole entire league, they only score four goals. You know, So they're, they're, they're not this machine that's going to go out and hit one or two goals, or two or three goals every single game. And they're also, go back to the Derry game on that, and I like what you says there around about the media. After the game, Jim McGuinness was asked a question, was from Tommy Rooney, where he says, you clearly led, um, or you clearly knew about uh, Owen Lynch coming out, you clearly targeted, you went long, and you knew that was coming about. Jim McGuinness didn't even ask, answer the question. The question was asked, answered before it was even asked of him, because he just went around, yeah, yeah, and then the media jumped on and it was, oh, Jim McGinnis would work the Masters group there. On that day, Derry had an off day. They, they, were, they weren't lucky to beat Derry, but certainly by numbers, Derry were very, very close. But what Donegal, what a lot of teams do now is say, oh, Patton's kickout is absolutely fantastic. If we'll get caught out back if we don't drop back and they'll often give up a short. Donegal's team, their whole game plan is based around a bit of possession, be that from short kickouts or be it from turnovers. Once they get the possession, it's very hard to get around because their basic skills are so good. Their hand pass mm. is so good. They don't give away stupid ball. They don't go carry balls in the tackle, and they will shoot and shoot off them. And if you can get those basics right, brilliant. Now, 123 in a game is absolutely phenomenal. Even if they were only getting 50% on their normal shots, they still would have probably won yesterday, or, uh, yesterday's game. I, I, it's just the way Jim McGinnis has brought them into it. It's a thing called psychological safety, whereby... Those players are not afraid to shoot. It's part of their culture now where how many games do you, do you have in the uh, and Finn, you, you hit a shot and if it's from an acute angle or it's from you know, outside that safety zone, how many of your players, your team will turn around and went, fuck, you can shot again the man, the better player. That doesn't happen, Donegal. It's just next ball, let's go again, right? You were right to shoot there. There was an opportunity. Move on, next ball. We'll win the turnover. We'll get it and we'll get up the pitch and get another score or get another shot up as quick as possible. You know, they, they've had teams through it this year. I think Armagh fell for it in the Ulster final. Armagh changed their whole setup because Armagh are so good on a press that they changed their setup thinking that um, Donegal were going to be catching them out over the back. And it worked on that day because Armagh just went short and outscored them um, throughout the length of the game itself. I think Trone set up pretty well against them to keep it sort of narrow and conservative. They weren't going to concede an awful lot. But at the end of the day, they weren't going to win either. 
So I think when it comes to Galway's, Galway's setup is enough that they can get set up defensively in their good shape. They will not leak goals at the back. Um, but they're they're strong enough to press them as well. If you can press Donegal and stop them getting that initial kick out from, I think it's it's how you beat Donegal. Absolutely. Very well said, lads. Very well said. I suppose we move on to the other action that took place over the weekend. On Saturday, you had Armagh against Roscommon. It was Armagh 2-12, Roscommon 12 points. Good win for the Armagh, lads. They're happy enough. It didn't take penalties. It didn't take extra time. Armagh got the job done. The sending off for Roscommon probably did change the game to agree, Mr. Prendergast. But look, Armagh are true to an all Ireland semi-finals uh, for the first time since 2005. And on the go... Yeah, look, that was the most important thing for, for Armagh was to get the job done, was to get the win. Like, first semi-final, obviously, since 2005. Like, there's been, I suppose, so much pressure on them in quarterfinals in the last few years. But I was very disappointed in Roscommon, in all, in all honesty. Like, just one point in the opening 30 minutes. Um, I thought it was very comfortable, really, for <clears throat> Armagh. Like, we didn't see the same levels that Roscommon played with against Tyrone, uh, in in my opinion. I thought there was, there was too much backwards hand passes, too much sidewards hand passes. Um, and it was just very, very comfortable for Armagh. But look, fair play to Armagh, like Barry McC- McCambridge, brilliant with 1-2, Connor Thurba obviously with 1-2 as well. Big mistake, obviously, from uh, f- from Connor Carroll with the with the goal, probably a bit similar to the mistake he made against Cork last year. Um, and ultimately, I suppose, yeah, it, it was very, very comfortable for, for Armagh. Like Russ Common really didn't really click into gear. As I said before, like the passes weren't really there. They went down to 14 men. But even before that, you never felt like they were getting getting back into this game. And I think of all the games at the weekend, this was probably the most comfortable. Um, like Derry were poor enough against Kerry, but you felt like with the quality of players they had, that so maybe they could they could get themselves back into it. Like this game could have been played in another two hours, and I don't think Roscommon would have ever got back into it. Um and look, I suppose the big one now for Armagh is, look, can they go on now? Can they push on? Can they be Kerry? Like, they've more than a good enough chance to, but at the same time, Kerry have been there and done it, and that's the big thing. Um, But yeah, absolutely huge for, for McGinney and for Armagh, especially after the, the years of heartbreak and the penalty shootouts and all the rest. Yeah. Thanks, McCarthy. Yeah, um, a bit of loaded notes in this game, so just happy to get him because I watched it in depth. I mean, we had a team was coming, still haven't won a championship game in Cook Park since 1980, which is a long, long time. And the flatter to deceive in this one, as Aaron Roy, you pointed out, in the first the first 15 minutes were just, oh, I'm sure Davey Byrne. In his in his tenure and what is it three years three years now and was common he he's sitting back going he couldn't have had a worse fifteen minutes have he to plan that um Armagh's stats in Cork over the last twenty nineteen twenty years pretty horrible um so you know with two teams going in who psychologically needed a big game and a big victory um and one of them was going to get it and look Armagh have got it um was it pretty. Uh, absolutely not. Will McGinney and his squad be over the moon? Absolutely. Um, they've been here, they've been to the well so much over the last three, four years, and they've always not got there. And this is the first time really where they're coming in, a lot at stake, inside on the big day, and uh, they've come up from... Will they helped? Absolutely. We're coming. I'll start with them first. Horrible. And um, the first 15 minutes... It's, Two men down injured. Um, shot selection that they had was incredibly poor. Um, it was common overall. I mean, we look at young Dada Craig, a lot has been said about him over the past three years or so. Absolutely right. So, didn't really perform in the big stage uh, compared to what he had been in the week or the week, last week against their own. Um, Dermot Murda has been a consistent performance for his common for the last four or five seasons. Didn't really show up to Crow Park. Um, big shout out to Brand Stack, by the way. What a mm-hmm. performance from Brand Stack. Led from the front. Heart of an absolute lion. The point he scored showed everything that was common shooter had. You know, he, as a man, brought everything that you wanted that day. He brought heart. He brought desire. You know, he was going through tackles. He was he, he was absolutely exceptional uh, from his common point of view. Pity there was only one of them. 
did the game change on Mark McNally's second decision? In a way, it did. Um, because West was coming were rotten early on. Armagh really didn't kick on to the decent start they've had. Let's remember, Armagh, if I'm right, got a point straight from the kickoff um, and set their intentions out pretty early. Or straight from the win, sorry. Early, uh, I think it was Ray Ingram did in the end, was it Connor Turbot maybe took the first point. Um, but then they sort of sat back in. Um, they were a wee bit pedestrian lethargic for my, for my liking. Um, it was a harsh second yellow card on, on Rui Fallon. There's no doubt about that. I mean, if Martin McNally goes back to review that, you know, Rui Gugan jumps into him a wee bit. It's not as high as maybe Martin has seen first time around. But it does change the game. It gives Armada a wee bit more flexibility. And especially when you're inside Cope Park, you have a rigid game plan like was common or most teams do inside there where, you know, playing, playing that game plan, you know, for what the cuts of 50 minutes, maybe 55 minutes, uh, down to 14 men, you know, it's, the odds are stacked highly against you. Um, so for me, you know, it, it does have a say in the game. Um, Look, going in one three to four points up at the break, a man up and you expected our man to kick on. They didn't. In front of there was common that came out with a bit of fight at the early second half, start of the second half. But the point I want to make, and it was actually attacked Johnny who murdered early actually to see. So one of the two lads can tell me. Connor Turbot's from I think he's from Lurgan as well. The North Armagh massive. They were they were unbelievable for Armagh. I think out of Armagh's final total, they kicked all but two points, you know. So, you know, you got Barry McCormick in there, you got Turbin in there. Soupy Campbell coming off the bench was exceptional. His efficiency with the ball, his control on the ball, um, you know, he brought that extra pair of time into the team, you know. So, so the North Armagh massive really stood up. You know, young Connaughton from uh, Tien and Oban, Porter Down, excellent game as well from play. Um, so, so them lads really stood up to the fore for Armagh. The one thing I, w- uh, I would say about Armagh, you know, they got over the line. Look, a win's a win. Gareth South keeps saying that at the minute for and whatever else. You get all the critics you want. Armagh didn't really manage the game as well as I wanted them to manage the game. You know, at this end, this is the end of the season. You've got to make good choices on the ball. I put it into the group. There is no rule in the GA that says you have to score. Um, When they were ahead in the game, they were making risky passes. They were turning over the ball. And indeed, was coming hit one or two really bad ways late on in the second half. I mean, one springs to mind from Dara Craig that he, he doesn't miss every other week from maybe 20, 25 yards in front of goal. So, you know, Armagh would need to manage the game for me better. Again, Ian Passerino need by a wee bit. And I think they need a big, big game from him the next day. You know, um, he come off. Um, back to my, my previous point of, of not managing the game well. His brother Arshin come on, had a really bad shot into the hell at one stage where he could have went on with the ball. So shot selection, when they were on the ball, when they were in control of the game, for me, they made one or two bad selections. So look, psychologically, Armagh had to get over that barrier. They got over it. Did they get a bit of a help with a, a harsh sending off? Absolutely. Um, is there lots for them to work on over the next two weeks? Yeah, huge amounts. And for me, one or two of their you know, of their big high-profile names, uh, particularly Rain O'Neill. And, you know, I, I, I'm not picking on him here, but he's going to have to come, come out of his box. He's, you know, he's going to have to have a big performance in Quebec the next day because, you know, the game really did pass him by. But big shout-out to the, the North Armagh Massive, if you want to put it that way. They were the ones that stood up. They were the ones that brought the game home for them. And uh, I'm sure the likes of Jimmy Smith and people in there are going to be uh, absolutely over the moon um, the way them guys play. Mr. Kennedy, lot to chew the fat on there. Yeah, look, not spent too much on. I think Kevin, you know, both Kevin and I make great points. And Kevin is right on it, you know, that at the end of the day, then two men or uh, sorry, a man sent off so long in the game and you only won the game by two scores causes a bit of concern for me. I know it's six points, but it's two kicks of a ball that's in it. Um I think that Arma didn't get their for being in Croke Park, they didn't get it nailed on right. And there were the opportunities to improve are there. And they could do this against Kerry. They could do it against Kerry. They have got themselves sorted now by, they, I think they've accepted 
they can force teams to go long and compete with them and do a high press. That's two uh, goals now in the last two games they got from turnover so high up the pitch from kickouts. But I think that they're missing Finney in his way now. But he touched on it earlier on. John, you touched on it as well around about that number 11. I would love to say, a bit like whenever Kerry won the All-Ireland back in 2022, they played Johnny O'Shea as an outlet in number 11, had David Clifford in behind him. And I think that Armad need to not just worry about dropping men back. I don't think their defensive structure is brilliant. I think they're really good tacklers. They're strong and physical. They can turn the ball over and get good tackles in. But I think they over-rely on having too many bodies back there. And there's a couple of times on, particularly the first half, they were coming out with the ball. Ian Forker at one stage looked up and there was no one ahead of him. He was the furthest man up the pitch. He hadn't got to the halfway line. Yet. So I think if they're going to beat Kerry, they need to take a bit more risk and play more players further up the pitch. And I would like to see Turbo sitting up there full time. Even somebody like Green just hold your centre half forward and that's where you're sitting at there. Um, I think then they will have a quick outlet for it. They have quick release and get in. Um, but yeah, I wasn't impressed with our ma and their performance. I don't think Ross Common. I think Ross Common are a good team, but they've struggled through it this year. They, for me, are a team who don't score highly. They against Cavan was the only team where they ranked up a half decent score, but they still can see it at one twenty. And you know, Cavan won't be getting the um play carry next week or in two weeks time in the Ireland final. So I think our ma. Did answer a question. They did psychologically kind of touch on getting over that line there. But for me, that's their ceiling. They've now reached it. That I don't I can't see them getting anywhere close to um Kerry. And I think they're just still over cautious in how they play. I just don't think that they're not risk taking enough in that. Um but yeah, they're good. It's I don't think Davy Burke will be on Ross Common next year. I don't know what he said after the match. If you up listening to him in a way, I don't think he'll be there next year. But Brian Stack, having for some there as well. Absolutely fantastic. It's only been friendly to the game. It deserves all the applause that he gets, even though he was on the, the losing team for that. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I didn't I did enjoy the game. I thought that Ross Ross Common made a lot more errors. Both teams had to play in the same conditions. There was a downfall beforehand. The pitch was wet, slippy. You could see that on the game. Arma handled it much better. Turbo has been the player of the year off. For them this year, being used again wasn't really challenged the nets in terms of shots, but his kickouts were his distribution again was fantastic on that. Um, Barry McCambridge has been in and out of the team. His goal, Jesus Christ, tonight it's a cracking goal. You know, mm-hmm. see where he came from in that. Um, and that that's the only thing that Carrie'll have to worry about. But Carrie'll have men who can track and get back as well. Um, where I don't think Ross Common have clicked this year at all. So I, I wasn't blown away by the performance. But they're in the all Ireland semi final. The thing is, you have to get over a semi final. Finals are for winning. You know, the finals are anything you have in the final, but you have to get there. And I can't see them getting close to Kerry. I think Kerry will stay with them maybe five points up. You know. Just the other point on that, I don't know. It'd be interesting to get Kevin and Aaron's view on this. I think it's a wee bit hard. I I, I don't mean to say this derogatory, so I hope people from North Common aren't upset with me. Was Common are a small enough county in terms of size and pay? And when we're looking at the championship structure, uh, at the minute, sort of like a, a, a quarter championship that we're having. Um, but it's such a big up last week in Tyrone and put so much effort into that game. Mm. And, you know, early, like after 15 minutes, you've two players been down injured. Now, it can happen at any time. But you're wondering, is that short turnaround around time, whether it be six days or 14 days? Sorry, 13 days, whatever it happens to be. It, is Does that suit some teams more than other teams, if you, if you get me? Yeah, I, I know speaking to a few boys here involved with different um, county teams at the minute, Division 1 teams, and they're saying that this year they noticed a bit of a spike towards the end of the league in terms of soft tissue injuries that were coming in. So that week on week um, does have an impact on it. But there's, there's, I was thinking about this over the weekend as well, Kevin, how many teams did last week that went through this week and, and all that jazz with it? It just shows you the importance of, one, getting to your provincial final because you get a home game in your first your first sort of game of that sort of new system that's up in there. To get a home win is hugely important. If you can get a home win, you're up. The chances are you getting through. Only Galway, I think, were the team who didn't, and they didn't get the um through. They had to play the extra week on. But it came down that those players again got an extra week's rest. So there's benefits, even though you know that the that you can rant about the monster championship and the monster championship, there's huge benefits to get to the provincial final and win it later on 
down the lane. And I, that actually make, makes a big, big difference. And I think it did this week. Yeah, I think they're changing the, the structure next year anyway. I think they're going to be making making changes with it. But yeah, I think like Galway were the only team that came that came from the prelims that obviously went through this year. Monaghan were the only team last year. So when you look across eight games, there probably is enough data there to suggest that it probably isn't working. And especially when you look at the amount of injuries, Galway are racking up as well, even when they're winning and and these teams are racking up like um it probably is far too condensed and I think the whole idea of three teams going through in the groups, like they definitely need to scrap that for next year. And to be fair, I think I think um, Jared Burns has already come out and said that they will. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what they do next year. Yeah, it's tweaks. Kevin, so he will be happy with the condensed mm. and everything. It's just what about doing what even better? If that's a question, even better. If it's not about it doesn't work, so the baby out with the bathwater. It's what small changes can we make, even every year, or every year, second year, that will improve it. Yeah, yeah, continuous improvement. Yeah, because I think what Aaron says, there are three teams going from the uh, group stages and if, if no matter how many games you lose, you still can get through. So like that does need to be changed. Last game of the weekend, lads. Oh, God, a poor one to finish on. We expected so much better from this. It was Kerry against Derry in the All-Ireland quarterfinal yesterday in Crook Park. It was Kerry 15 points, Derry 10 points. Um, Yeah, lads, I don't know what you thought of this one. I think it was probably one of the worst games of football I've ever seen inside of Crook Park for some time. Um, I think it really, really put everyone to sleep in Christ. I don't know what how you're feeling after the game. It was just a desperate game of football, and it just this complete and utter bullshit of Chrissy McKay getting up and around David Clifford and annoying him all the game and just shoving him and pushing him and putting his knees into him. It just it drove me mad. But lads, I how'd you talk with this game, Miss McGarty? John, um, it's just it's I seen a British passport earlier. I don't have a British passport, by the way, but I seen a British passport. And on one side you have a lion, and the other side you have a unicorn and a ball and chain. And the Scots are on the ball and chain. And I thought to myself, was not like most of the teams this week. There was no shackles taken off by Kerry. They're really beginning to annoy me with this. They seem to have a ball and chain round them all the time. Kerry football is about forward, progressive, the Brazil. They want to go forward. They want to play with Fleur. They want to get the marquee players on the ball. And over the last three, four seasons, they haven't bloody well done it. And you should, this game was, I think the Irish Times described it this morning as pedestrian. I would call it bollocks. In fact, at one stage, it was flicking between GA Go and Cash and Yadick. It was that bad. You know? Um, it was absolutely and utterly horrendous. It was yeah. lethargy filled up. It was, as you say, pulling and dragging off the ball. And if you actually look at the other three, the three games, whether it be Davy Byrne or Kieran McGinney, whether it be Jerry Brennan, um, whether it be Desi Farr, whether it be Jim McGuinness, or whether it be Paul Joyce, I'd say to them, listen, see at the end of the day, you can look yourself in the mirror on a Monday morning and say, fuck it, we had a go. We weren't cautious. You know, these two, it was just over-cautious. And Every time, if you look at it over the years, every time Mickey Hart comes up against Kerry, put into the group yesterday, he drags Kerry down to their level. I'm not saying that's a bad thing in Mickey Hart. He can only play with a hand he's dealt with. Right? Kerry should be blowing Derry out of the water yesterday. Derry are coming into that game on the back of maybe a month's very poor um, mentally they're, they're in a weak enough place. Kerry have all the assets. They have Obviously, the two Clippers up front, they have Sean or O'Shea. They have a decent midfield pair, and they have Gavin White and, uh, Gavin White and, uh, and, and Brian O'Brigley at uh, uh, wing half back, marauding forward, and they have Tony Brosnan. And like, it was just horrendous. It, it infuriates me to talk about this game. Yeah, it really was, does. Oh, pissed. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. The, mm. the, the one thing I could have told you last Friday is, uh, uh, you know, before the game, and I'm sure Kevin and, and Aaron, it doesn't take freaking Albert Einstein to work this out. Shane McGuigan was going to be the one potent threat that Kerry had to deal with, and that was it. Yet Kerry, for some reason, they didn't go on the front foot. You know, Dan Gooley put it into the group, and I couldn't have said it better. They all carry for uh, over the last couple of years. It's so conservative. Mm. If Kerry want to open up, they will blow 90 and barn maybe Dublin on their day. And that's what made the other Ireland the other year so good because they just both went out. And Kerry don't seem to want to do that at the minute. Mm. And it's really annoying me. And 
Look, John, just one or two more points in Kerry. I said it during the week. I like Paul Murphy as a wing back. I don't like him as a cornerback. And then later on, did you get in the championship? You're going to come up, you know, the business end of the season. Armagh will pose problems for this Kerry defence. Armagh have really, really good inside forwards. The guy coming off the fence that should be Campbell. Who can if, score, they're like right though, if, if, if they're used yes, right, though, Kevin. If they're used right, though. If they're used right. If they're not used yeah. right, Armagh may fucking forget about it. Like. Yeah, but I mean, the Kerry defence, my point is the Kerry defence is there to be got at. I really do think that. And, you know, the Kerry psychologically have found it hard to get over Armagh the last 15, 20 years, especially when McGinney around. You know, he's experienced with beating Kerry in big games. So, I mean, Kerry have a lot to be worried about at the minute. Um, again, the overall alliance and David Stafford doing things like pulling out by that outrageous mark at one stage, you know. Um, they're just not clicking up front. I mean, I reckon Tony Brosnan. Tony Brosnan, I don't know if uh, uh, viewers might agree with this or not. A couple of years ago in the Sigerston, I was watching this guy going, my God, are we seeing the next big thing in Kerry here? He could play at centre half forward. He was raiding by guys. He could play in the middle of the park. You know, he kept points for fun. His fitness and skill level, everything. I mean, there. And he's just not bloody well opening up. And he's just fitting shit out of me. You know, and you know, I'm a massive Kerry fan. And at the minute, they're just not opening up. They're like a, a thoroughbred horse in the stables that just wants to get out onto the turf and run in a in a grade one race and, and mm. beat everybody up by five furlongs. But they're not being allowed out of the stables at the minute. And it's mm. it's so frustrating to watch. And yes, in this game, it'll go down in history books. But to the history books, let it be confined. It was absolutely rotten. Mm. Just a quick word on Derry. Um, Look, I said it two seasons ago, and I still think the same, and it's very easy for Derry. Derry have always had very good defenders. Um, they can always play. Most teams can be structured into that defensive system. Derry have got it on earth one or two most going forward to take that burden off Shane McGuigan. That's an easy narrative, but it's there to be seen in the stats. And even, you know, even Lock Murray. Lock Murray. Connor Lock- Glass always gets the point. Lock Murray was poor too, I thought. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Lock Murray's good, but, but, uh, but what I'm saying is... It- you can't have one or two scores. You need to share that burden. If we look at if we look at across Armagh, if we look across Dublin, if we look across um particularly um Donegal at the weekend, six, seven, eight different scores. You know. So for Derry to for Derry to to break that glass ceiling that Kevin's talking about Armagh maybe reached, Derry for me, they need to uncover one or two more scoring forwards at least. Skinner Bradley, Kev. <laughs> Skinner. They could do worse. They could do worse. You get a worse man. That boy. That boy could. That boy could still do a job. Let me tell you. <laughs> he is unbelievable. I absolutely love Skinner. Paddy's not bad either. Mister Kennedy, this game was a ball of shit. Let's not beat around the bush. No, look. I, I think the standard of the game wasn't up there. Uh, I, it was a very nervy game. Interesting to see you know, carry carry beat Derry by five points. It was 15 scores they hit, um, and they were very conservative with approach. So as Kevin's rightly mentioned there, if they do take a shackles off or they're permitted to take a shackles off, be that by their style of play or what way the other teams then what could this team potentially score on a day? You know, they had 27 shots yesterday, just over 50% on, so not a good day of shooting around. But look, they've done enough to get the semi-final now. It's their first day for Park this year, um, or the championship. There was a lot of talk about them coming in, not having them, not having met anybody on the way in there, and there's just talk that every year they carry haven't met anybody and need tested. Maybe yesterday was just that opportunity. Let's get over this one and we'll we'll build for the All Ireland semi final now. So I would imagine they change their approach on. I think there's a lot to be said around about Derry in itself too. You know, Derry, Arn, you'll remember we were on your own um, Billy Fan TV podcast whenever it came around about this. Um, that Derry's approach. The rate was on the wall since the West Mead game. What was going to happen here? The rate was on the wall from the West Mead game. How they have changed their style of football since that annihilation by Armagh is as clear as day. We talked about Jim McGuinness. Jim McGuinness sticking to a process that has worked for him. Shoot and shoot often. He got that idea, that concept from Derry. He got it from Glenn. That's the way they play football. But as soon as it came to the Armagh game, where Derry were missing players, they changed how they were going to go about the game. And 
unfortunately, it was a case of how much Donegal won by or how much Kerry won by yesterday, as opposed to Derry actually having a real chance. I done the I done some sort of numbers up earlier on. It's interesting to see, like they're against Donegal, Derry had hit thirty two shots. They they lost the game. They hit thirty two shots that day, and they outscored Donegal that day. Against um Galway with a man down, they hit twenty eight shots, and Galway outscored them by one that day as well. One score was a difference on it that day. Then it came to Armagh, whenever they had McKinless out, plus all their injuries out, and they stuck to the same process. What they should have done that day was accept, this isn't a game that we need to win. Let's run our bench. Let's get more players in there. Let's get the Downies more experience or whatever it might be and take the loss that's coming. They were completely blown out of the water that day and Armagh scored what was it, 20 scores to Derry's 15, Derry's 14. Now, whenever it went to Westmeath, their shot count just dropped down. They started playing a far more conservative game. They started to look for them to set percentage shots a lot more often. And they only hit, what was it, 20 shots against Westmeath and 17 against Mayo. If you hit 17 shots in a game, you have to be hitting 85% conversion to even be close to winning it. If you hit 30 shots again, 50% conversion gets you up in the, in the winning opportunity. So whenever they, the Armad or Dot, Derry's biggest thing was it didn't stick to their process it's worked for them over the last couple of years mm-hmm. they fell into we need a change it's not working for us instead of removing the emotion from it and just looking at the numbers for me they were always going to beat Mayo I think they were always a better team than Mayo even if they had stuck to their, their own process against Mayo that seen them so um, not so well not so well off the start of the, the championship but if they had stuck to that process chances are they still would have got to the quarterfinal but the difference would have been they would have been with the chance of beating Kerry. They had no chance of beating Kerry yesterday with the system they played, not a mission. And to be the sure to Kerry, like you know, their big players didn't really have a, a huge game. I thought Brian Bugley or Bugley with um his his performance history wasn't outstanding. You know, it wasn't um a Connor Turbot performance, it wasn't a Shane Moss performance, but it stood out in that game because it was such a low quality. Yeah. But was it um, Dylan Casey or what do you call it, the guy who came on? Killian Burke. I thought Killian Burke coming on, he, he's going to be a football. He had a big impact in the game. Where he came on, he provided a wee bit of energy, a wee bit more going forward from. And in the past, Kerry had maybe struggled for that impact from the bench. So I, I like that. I like seeing him coming on. I thought he had a good game where he came on. So, yeah, it's, a, it's another day for Kerry. I think we'll see a different Kerry come Arma, and they'll be allowed because our model try and play some sort of attack on football there too, they'll be allowed to show a bit more themselves. Hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Mr. Pernigas to wrap it up. <clears throat> yeah, look, overall it was a very poor game. Um six points apiece uh, at half time. Like it was um I think like at the start of the weekend, I think we all would have expected this to be the the game of the weekend and everything else, but it definitely wasn't. It was it was really, really poor. Um but I think I think Kerry haven't been there so often, haven't been in this situation on numerous times. I think that was probably the difference in the end. Um, and as Kev said there, like some of the options from the bench were made a big impact. Like Killian Burke was brilliant. Killian Spillane as well came off the bench and got a point. Um, Sean O'Shea really pressed on towards the end. They kicked three points in total, one towards the end of the game as well. <clears throat> and I think for Derry, like it was just, it was a very lifeless performance from Derry really. Like, Towards the end of the game, they needed a goal. I think you could tell, right? They need a goal, and they never ever look like working a goal chance. Like they, Connor Glass floated one in in the square towards the end, and that was it. Like they were missing fairly easy chances. Um, whether it's the players have stopped playing for Mickey Hart, whether it's the fact of they've had too many games on the road, consistently changing tactics, and um, changing approaches and everything else. I don't know, but I think it's it's mad. Like this, the, you know, last year when Derry got bet by Kerry, we were saying. Right, Derry aren't far off now. Like they probably they just need to take that one more step. Whether that's going to be Kieran Mina or they're going to bring someone new in, like they've obviously done with Mickey Hart. But now they look further away than they, you know, than 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 they have last year and the years previous. So, um, yeah, like I think massive soul searching for Derry. Um, and to be honest with Kerry, I, I wasn't entirely impressed by them either. And um, I, I would fancy them to get over the line against Armagh, but at this moment in time, I, I think the all around winner is going to come from. The only goal, goal again. 
There we go, lads. There we go. Yeah. And I just I, I just seen a, a picture earlier on today of Rory Gallagher looking glum after I think a National League final that they were betting. And oh, a penny for his thoughts after you know his uh his I suppose his exodus of that dairy team. But there we go, lads. There we go. All the action nicely summed up by all the gentlemen on the podcast tonight. Well, lads, thanks a million for joining me this week. And of course, this podcast is brought to you by orgaretch.com. Use the rule general podcast, get 15% off on their website. No football this weekend. It's the small ball time. So we'll be back next weekend for more chat, more crack. Uh, former Anthem footballer Kevin McGarty, GA Sports Tracker app owner Kevin Kennedy, and Gaelic Fan TV host creator Aaron Prendergast, and of course, former goal footballer Finian Handy. Thanks a million for joining me this week, lads. Have a great week. Thank you very much. Yeah, Brilliant stuff, lads.